you're living off the land. You're not going to the grocery store and paying for food. You're learning about nature and learning what's already out there that you can just go pick and eat um, and gain nutrition from without having to go through uh, McDonald's or uh, spend a lot of money at the, at the grocery store. And I kind of think of uh, looking for open source intelligence uh, almost in a lot of ways like foraging. Uh, rather than spending a lot of money on super expensive security tools, um, you can sort of just look outward at uh, the public, look at information that's already sitting in the public domain, in the public consciousness, um, and use that uh, in a meaningful and actionable way. So before I talk about um, some examples of um, how you can uh, use open source intelligence, uh, I'm gonna give a little a bit of prehistory. Uh, how did we get here? How did so much uh, intelligence uh, information, how did all of these signals, uh, so much signal, uh, end up in the public internet? How did we reach this point? Um, also, I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that um, CISOs and security owners face uh, in, the, uh, in enterprises and small businesses uh, when it comes to trying to manage and understand the security of both themselves and their third parties that they don't necessarily own but they do business with um, and how open source intelligence can, uh, can help determine uh, security posture uh, non-intrusively and, and a lot of times uh, free. So anybody actually who works in an uh, enterprise company, a small business, if you're a security owner, if you're a pen tester, um, that precursor information is really great to know because it can really help you relate to uh, the clients that you're dealing with and some of their biggest pain points and also help to deliver uh, meaningful information that help companies not just patch a hole but actually uh, improve their, and uplift their overall security posture uh, in a repeatable way. I'll also talk about some common uh, pitfalls that we see uh, in the uh, um, enterprise uh, organizations with uh, open source intelligence, uh, ways to make open source intelligence actionable. There's a lot of sort of signal to noise ratio in open source intelligence. So how do you really identify the little, the gem, the, the piece of gold that you can use and how do you use it in a meaningful way? And some challenges with open source intel as well. So first I'm gonna talk about um, What's happened in the past 10 years? How did we reach this point where, um, you know, human beings uh, at this point in history have uh, more information uh, accessible at their fingertips um, than ever, than ever in recorded history? Um, how did we reach the point where so much information just sort of ended up in the cloud? And if you think about, we're basically going through a paradigm shift. If you think about uh, 10 or 20 years ago, what a data center looked like in an organization, in an enterprise organization, it generally sat in the, in the basement, in the lower level where it was cool. Um, you had uh, giant cages. I mean, this is what kind of corporate cloud data centers look like now, but many large Fortune 1000 uh, companies have had and still have large internal data centers. Um, you can sort of think of them as the traditional or legacy model. Um, data centers were in-house, you had physical access to them, so if there was a problem, if something went out, there was, uh, you know, you had the lock and the key. You could go into the room, you knew the people in the room around you, all of the system administrators had had background checks, you eat lunch with them, you know them on a personal level, and you feel like you can trust them with your keys to the kingdom. Um, now, sort of juxtapose that against uh, the new model, the cloud model, moving everything to uh, uh, a microservice uh, in the cloud. Uh, everything is off-premises, so you don't have a massive data center in your basement anymore. It's all uh, in somebody else's data center, uh, sometimes in a different country. You have no physical access to that data center, so um, if something goes down, if you're unsure about something, you've pretty much you know, uh, passed the responsibility and the risk on to some individual that you're sort of trusting to do a great job uh, managing the data. Um, but on the flip side, you know, the cloud is, is a beautiful thing because it's 100% turnkey. So you literally can just plug and play. There's no, uh, you know, uh, deep knowledge required to configure. There's no hardware implementation costs. It's completely elastic, so you only get what you need when you need it. Um, and you don't have to maintain headcount. So from a company's perspective, it's a really beautiful thing because they don't have to invest in the um, deep employee knowledge that you used to see uh, taking place. And it's also a very sad thing because you don't have as much in-house knowledge um, in terms of what's going on on your network. 
in the sort of old landscape, um, you can think about kind of old versus new as uh, fortress versus ecosystem. And, and the traditional uh, way we thought about security was protecting the fortress. Um, the fortress were, were the four walls of our business where all of the sensitive data was stored. Um, you could step outside of the fortress and it was maybe kind of old and crumbling, but you can at least see where all of the holes are in the fortress or where maybe some work needs to be done. Whether or not you patch those holes is strictly up to how responsible the person is, but you can uh, at least uh, somewhat easily with common tools identify uh, where these holes are. And you also own the blueprint. So you know the lay of the land. This is your territory that as a security owner you can navigate, you can understand, and you can diagnose and fix. Um, you also have full control. So if you want security continuity, rolling out uh, audit policies or procedures, you want to make sure all of your employees are following certain standards, you can literally, with a few configurations or the flip of a switch, ensure that everybody in the company is using two-factor authentication. You can actually monitor the behavior of, uh, of those controls. You also know where the crown jewels are located. So, um, you know, the sensitive employee information, credit card information, uh, customer information, you know that it's sitting in a treasure chest inside the secret room. You know that you need to at least build a perimeter around that and have some, some guards and some safety measures to detect if anybody's trying to break in. Um, and every all of the data was uh, centralized at this point, so you could have all of your logs under one room, under one house, piping to an aggregation system and have the insight that you need. Whether or not, again, the insight is fine-tuned enough to identify the outliers is really up to how diligent the individual is, but you at least have the control. And the mentality and the mindset behind protecting the fortress was uh, if we're going to get breached, what are we going to do about it? So we were never certain that we were going to get breached when protecting the fortress because we thought that we could control um, the four walls around us. But we felt like if it happened, let's have an action plan. Let's be prepared to know what to do. The landscape has vastly evolved from the fortress model. Um, the entire landscape has become completely decentralized and we've realized that commerce is not about everybody working within their four walls of the fortress, but everybody actually interconnecting and working together, almost like a hive or a honeycomb mentality where companies are reliant on supply chain partners, business partners, various third parties, for critical components of their business, like processing credit cards or paying for employee payroll. We depend on corporations, which are really just a house full of humans that we don't necessarily know or we've vetted, to take care of these critical functions of our organizations. The other big shift is we see that employees have now become empowered to sort of be their own CEO. They can be their own micro-organization walking around. Developers walk around with a laptop and have an, uh, uh, their employer's entire uh, code repo cloned to their database. That means every employee is walking around with a little miniature version of the production environment on their laptop. And they're empowered to do so. It's encouraged because you're not restricted. You're not chained to the desk. You can go and work anywhere and, and uh, still be, be able to get the same amount of, same velocity of work accomplished. There's also a lot of trust that's put into the decentralized architecture. So when we're doing business with third parties, when we're doing business with um, uh, supply chain partners, uh, we don't have a great idea about you know, maybe how they're protecting information or the ways that we're measuring their security level are very archaic and esoteric, but we sort of rely on them to, uh, and, and hope and assume that, our partners are at least as diligent as we are in protecting our information, but we don't really know for sure. And when you think about where the crown jewels are located, they're, they're really everywhere. Like, we don't even really know for sure, but we know they're uh, redundant, we know they're distributed, uh, but we don't really know who's looking at them. So when you're storing your database and it's hosted by Rackspace or it's hosted by Amazon uh, Web Services, we don't know who the engineers are behind the scenes that are managing those databases for us. We don't really know who's holding the keys to the kingdom. We've never done a background check on these employees. Uh, we've never sat and ate lunch with them. We've never built the level of trust that we used to have in the industry, but we're trusting them to uh, manage and protect our data, at least up to our standards. And to boot, they're distributing the data, not just in one location, but it's distributed everywhere. 
sort of under the guise of redundancy, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but has to be used with responsibility. And we have high dependencies on these, um, on our ecosystem partners. Um, I'm sure as everybody can, can think back to a few, you, a few years ago when, you know, Amazon, for example, has an outage in their East Coast, commerce basically ceases for a day across the United States because one company has had an outage, not an entire outage, but an outage in just one section of their infrastructure. So the impact is, the ratio impact is very high. Um, a credit card processor going out for a day ceases commerce on your, on your e-commerce website. You can no longer accept payments. The mentality has also changed um, in terms of where the risk lies. Um, generally, risk, if, there were any, if there was any risk in a traditional organization, it lied within the fortress. Now the risk is distributed. There are, there's not just one risk, but there are many degrees of risk. Um, so you can think of sort of the breach by association uh, mentality that we hear about uh, uh, a lot today. And it's not just those third parties, but it's also employees um, that work within your habitat. So remote employees, employees traveling, um, if they get hacked, you get hacked. And the other paradigm shift that's taken place is it's no longer about if we get breached. And I know this is a cliche statement, but there are many, many, many companies that are still in the if mindset, that are still in denial about uh, the fact that they've probably already been breached and just don't know it. Um, we, as security professionals, know that the internet is inherently insecure. We're, we're well aware of it. And to be frank, a lot of people are very fearful about how we're going to manage security in the cloud. But the public consciousness is not aware of these vulnerabilities. They have no idea that any of this is going on right now. So what happened? Why, why all of a sudden did we decide to just outsource and rely on uh, third parties, rely on the cloud? What was the real, uh, where did the pressure come from to make this uh, pivot? Well, um, very traditionally in enterprises, uh, the perception by board members, the perception by C-level executives is that security is a cost center, not a profit center, meaning you're not generating any profit for the company uh, by implementing security. Maybe we can argue you certainly can, um, but it's a hard argument to make without concrete metrics and statistics and collateral. So the general perception is that security is a cost center. You're a utility that drains the company of money. Um, and the CFO or the chief operating officer of companies uh, will traditionally say things like, why are we spending so much money on this infrastructure? Why are we spending so much money on this massive retail footprint? Our entire basement is covered with electronics. We have thousands of employees that were paying full-time salaries and benefits to uh, manage and maintain. Um, why don't we just outsource it all to the cloud? I mean, it's, it's there, it makes sense, it's cheap, it's easy, I just have to put in a credit card number, it takes two minutes, I mean, the whole thing is streamlined. So for an ex from an executive standpoint, when they're sitting down with their tech team and security owners, it's a no-brainer, and it's very hard to justify the opposite. No full-time headcount, no hardware footprint, zero maintenance, it's on someone else's shoulders. There's really no su sunk costs, um, like hardware costs, for example, that depreciate year over year. Um, so they view it as a cost savings. And this was realized um, back in the early 2000s, sort of right after the dot-com um, boom and bust. We saw hardware prices uh, dramatically decreasing. And still today, there's a huge push to decrease hardware manufacturing costs to be as cheap as possible and move all of the, uh, the high-cost effort on building and developing the software. And this was realized very, very, very early on. Uh, CFOs were very much aware of this and have been pushing this agenda for uh, over 10 years. Um, really today. Now on the flip side, what we just now started to realize in the past four or five years is um, we kind of had like an oh shit moment. Uh, we realized that um, we gave all of our data to somebody else. <laughs> so we, we've effectively uh, relinquished all control of our data, all visibility of our data, and all transparency of our data. We don't know who's accessing it. We don't have the logs. We don't have the insight. Um, and we've lost the security continuity. So before I could implement a, a policy and cover everybody in the company, ensure everybody has antivirus, everybody has two-factor authentication, everybody's resetting their passwords and they're super complex. I don't have the same confidence that 
my thousands of third-party vendors that I'm relying on to do business are implementing those same controls. And right now, the status quo is simply sending them a questionnaire to ask them if they're doing a good job. Uh, it's just a trust-based exercise. And this wasn't realized up until, this was realized only up until recently as we started to see breaches by association take place. So hackers realized that rather than brute forcing somebody's firewall uh, login portal that's been publicly exposed, we could just go through a vendor or a partner. And a lot of times those vendors and partners already have all the data that we're looking for. So the company doesn't even know that their data's been exfiltrated, and probably the third party doesn't know either. So that 10-year gap is a rut row type moment. <laughs> and this is what uh, chief information security officers and security owners are now facing today. What makes it even more challenging to sort of, I don't know if anybody's ever watched Charlie Brown, but um, this is the analogy I kind of thought about. When, what makes it even harder to, uh, you know, for security owners is, uh, drumming up budget and actually trying to, to obtain the money to purchase the tools that they need to uh, protect even the fortress. And the often flow that you'll see, and this happens in literally every single organization um, that has, especially enterprise organizations, but even small, small business owners that have some type of security owner or CISO, uh, the CEO or a board member uh, will be watching a shock piece on like Fox News, Fox News about how Twitter was hacked or something uh, in the morning, and they'll shoot an email, subject line, how secure are we, to the security owner of an organization. And the CISO goes, oh shit, like, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a very difficult and complex question to answer, because you have many security tools monitoring the various layers of the security onion, and they all speak a different language. So some of your tools are saying you have web application vulnerabilities, some are saying you have open ports, some are saying uh, computers have viruses, some of them have been cleaned, some of them haven't been. And it's very difficult to get a clear, concise picture that's not speaking on the, the nerdy, techy level as a CISO would perceive it, but speaking on the apex level that, uh, that chief officers and board of directors can really understand. And they understand simple layman's terms, metrics, key performance indicators. So what happens is, is the CEO and the board of directors ask, how secure are we? And the CISO starts talking about all of the technical vulnerabilities and they just hear the, you know, wah, 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 like sort of how the teachers in Charlie Brown used to speak. So the information gets lost in translation. And there's a big discrepancy between how CISOs, uh, I'm sorry, how CFOs and board members uh, feel about um, security as a cost center versus how the CISO feels. So generally, uh, security budgets get slashed or outsourced. Uh, they save a bunch of money because they're not spending uh, six figures on IDSs or IPSs or um, you know the complex hardware that's required to get the insight that a security owner would need. And they feel great. They're under budget. Go cloud, new vacation home, new company car. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a good feeling from, from the board to, uh, to meet their fiscal goals um, and fulfill uh, their obligations to shareholders. Um, but this, this mentality leaves the chief information security officers or the security owners distraught. Because now they're thinking, what do I do? How can I protect information that I can't see? I'm, I'm responsible for my own fortress. I'm responsible for the ecosystem of companies that I do business with. I don't own them. I don't operate them. But somehow I'm responsible for managing their security and making sure that my information doesn't get hacked out of their systems. It's a lose-lose situation. What's even more frustrating for a security owner is when you think about how uh, the surface area uh, of attack is uh, widened exponentially as the fortress to eco sh ecosystem shift takes place. Traditionally with the fortress, you had companies doing direct attacks. So uh, generally, I mean, generally speaking, at least the high noise type attacks, you could detect in your own network. You would see people hitting your firewalls or see people trying to uh, brute force SSH, for example, um, and it was and it was um, somewhat easy to detect in logs if they were tuned properly. Now, as we increase our surface area and data moves into the habitat of employees who have endpoints end distributed everywhere, and one more ring move into the ecosystem of all of the companies that we depend on to do business, but 
don't necessarily own, the scope of attack is exponentially increased, and now you have not just one degree of threat, of, but you have four degrees of threat. My vendor's, vendor's, vendor's partner just got breached, and each link along the way has a security vulnerability that leads into my data center. Um, and that's the, that's the, I would say, one of the largest risks is that traversal through the various degrees of, uh, of uh, uh, connection and reliability on the ecosystem. The other two parts that are particularly concerning is that a hacker can now indirectly exfiltrate data from your company without even knocking on your door. Traditional security tools, what do they do? They, they blast packets, they're simulating a hack attack, they're going to your house, they're rattling the door, they're shaking the windows to see if they're locked, they're tapping on the glass to see if you have any fractures. And uh, lo and behold, they find out that um, this window is left open and, and the secret safe is, is right through that door. Uh, now, uh, we just have to look for an open port to a database that has administrative credentials on a third party that's storing your data in their data center and pull it right out. So you can pull company data from the core right from the outside layer of the ecosystem or even from the middle layer, the employee sort of habitat, um, pulling data from an employee endpoint. As I said earlier, employees are walking around with their full uh, or their organization's full production environment. Every, every engineer is going to have that. That's the cost of doing business. And it's a good thing. You want that distribution and you want that um, empowerment, but it has to be used responsibly. So those, those three ways on the right, um, especially the top two, are, are super easy using open source intelligence. They're completely stealth. So unless the vendor has some type of responsible disclosure in place where their partners that a breach has taken place, the core company is never going to find out. They're completely passive or even zero touch, and they're anonymous. The other big struggle that we see taking place is across the defense landscape. Um, this is something called the 80-20 Pareto Principle. Um, and the gist of this slide um, basically says that the legacy tools that we've been provided throughout the past 10, 15 years, these tool sets, uh, haven't kept, kept up with that shift, that paradigm shift from fortress to ecosystem. Um, and what's that, what that's led to is we see that at least 80, and I would argue even 90% of the security tools that are out there are just not properly equipped to diagnose, assess, analyze, and remediate the ecosystem threats. They just don't have that insight or that transparency. Um, they're still selling on sort of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt model. Uh, they generally, the way you know these security tools will work is they collect some data, they analyze it, and they spit out a report telling you uh, all the reasons why you're screwed. Like here's everything you need to fix. Pat you on the back. Good luck. Um, if you don't have anybody in your organization that understands security or is a security owner, um, it's probably going to be very difficult to remediate these issues because they're not giving you any actionable intelligence that you can use to fix it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they all speak different languages, so it's very difficult to pull them all together into one view and really understand um, at a metrics level what's going on. And without the metrics, without the dashboard, you're steering the ship blind. Arguably, what's more effective is the 20% or even the 3% of, uh, of uh, security controls that we implement in place, a lot of which can be based off of open source intelligence. So open source intelligence is all based around the context, right? You're telling a story based on these fragments of information. Um, they're generally uh, helping to prevent companies, uh, prevent the quickest path to a breach. So rather than pounding on the firewall, I can just go look to see if any of your employees' credentials have been leaked on the internet or start building profiles around your employees and use that to, ex to deduce passwords, log in, and wreak havoc. So this is preventing the, the quickest pass, and this is also helping to prevent the win. And that 5, 10, 20% of effort is generally free or very, very low cost. A lot of it comes down to education and awareness, and it will cover just reminding employees every two months not to click weird links, not to do, uh, to, you know, how to, how to tr tr create a truly uh, complex passphrase, not just a weird password that's hard to remember. Those small things will... They're not foolproof, but they'll cover a, a majority of, uh, of threats that companies face. Now, what does is, what is open source intelligence 
answer, what questions does open source intelligence answer for enterprises? And you can think of open source intelligence, um, it's kind of like you're looking outward to look inward. Uh, the traditional way of thinking is we need more data. We have to mine more of our systems, collect all of it, archive it, put it all in one big system, and then somehow identify those little outliers and, 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 and act on them, which is very, very challenging. Um, open source intelligence is the, ex it's a, it's the exact uh, uh, opposite methodology, which is let's not look inward, let's look outward. Let's look at everything that's already out in the public domain that already exists on the public web, on the deep web, and let's see what we can de deduce by concatenating this information together in a meaningful way. And that often not just tells you uh, a piece of uh, problem, but it tells you a whole story and it tells you a whole thought process that's led up to that point. Um, for your own company, for enterprises, OSINT is really meaningful because it gives companies insight into what a hacker can find out about them without knocking on the door. So rather than going and pounding on the windows and shaking the glass, uh, maybe they're three miles away looking at your house through binoculars. Maybe they're trailing your vehicle on the way to work. And they're using these patterns to find the best window of opportunity to steal the data. Or maybe places that you leave your data outside of your home. For third parties, I would argue that it's even uh, more interesting and applicable because uh, the big question that CISOs and security owners ask are, uh, are my partners at least as scrupulous as I am in protecting my data. And if I have to rely on them for these business operations like Amazon and other cloud vendors, I need to know that they're doing at least as good of a job as I am in protecting my info. And if you think about the status quo, how do we do that right now? As I mentioned earlier, it's usually one or two of two or three ways. Most companies do nothing. They don't ask their partners any questions and they just sign a contract, give them the data and move on. We call that the ostrich mentality. Just put your head in the sand and don't think about it. Uh, the other way is questionnaires. So you send a 50-page questionnaire asking, do you have antivirus, do you have firewall, and I'm trusting you to fill it out um, accurately and correctly, but I have no way to validate. Or maybe we, I perform a lightweight pen test or do an on-site security assessment. Uh, those are great, um, very useful, but they tell you their point in time. They tell you what's going on right now. They don't tell you what's going on in five minutes. And as we all know, data, historical data without any relevancy is useless. You need you need up-to-date, almost real-time information. And that information is what's ac actionable, and that information is what can actually plug the gaps and remediate future issues. Oh, and you can use, one thing I didn't mention is you can use open source intelligence not to deduce whether or not to do business with a third party, but you use it as a litmus test. You use it to say, uh, does this company really know what they're doing? Uh, do they have a mature security, information security uh, process and program in place? Or is it utter chaos? Um, have they had an issue for a day that they remediated? Or have they had an issue that's persisted for six months which led up to their breach? I mean, it doesn't mean you necessarily don't do business when you find open source intelligence issues. It means you confront the partners that you're working with and have a collaborative dialogue around what they're going to do to fix it. So thinking about uh, what's available in terms of open source, it's really, um, I call it the open source world market. Um, it's really, truly a medley of information that you can retrieve um, about a company, an individual, an organization, a lifestyle, just by looking outward, just by looking outward at what already exists in the public consciousness. There's uh, geospatial information, so location information about uh, where somebody currently is or um, their general day-to-day uh, -day paths and habits, uh, all sorts of metadata. So not just looking at the file itself, but what's behind the file. What are the notes and thoughts and usernames and paths and credentials um, that, have been, that have been embedded in that information? And how can we use that and concatenate that with other information to form a, path, uh, a pathway to breach? Um, you can even look in you know, print news, sometimes just reading pieces of text that people have published or talked about or spoke about or bragged about will give you insight into what they're doing. Um, social media, obviously an excellent source for open source intelligence. Monitoring social media effectively allows you to monitor the uh, behaviors and pathways of every employee within an organization. And if you're thinking about breaching that organization, watching companies' behavioral patterns almost like a living, breathing uh, organism allows you to find those uh, those holes, those windows for breach. Uh, misconfigurations, 
Uh, even looking at pictures, there's tons of information I'll talk about that you can pull just from an, a picture that's uh, been taken. And this intelligence can be found pretty much uh, everywhere. It's publicly accessible signals and data sets. Uh, you can a lot of times download them for free or use applications. There are some tools that are paid. They're generally um, fairly expensive uh, to, to acquire. Um, there are websites, databases that you can download. There are a lot of open source projects that help to enumerate this information. And a lot of it can just come from observation, just literally just being aware. Um, an over-the-shoulder observation, for example, could be a form of metadata, uh, paying attention to sort of what's between the lines. So I'm going to give some examples of metadata that you can retrieve, uh, what type of metadata we can find, uh, some examples, how it's useful, and um, what you can do to sort of protect it. So what's in a name? From one or two bits of information, it's possible to enumerate a vast amount of personal details about an individual, especially if their name or the business that they work in or the city that they live in is an outlier. If it's especially unique, it's even easier to pinpoint just about everything about them. And that includes things like medical records, so when did you get a checkup, what are your medication prescriptions, um, what are your personal interests? Usernames are particularly useful from an enterprise standpoint. Um, vacation, family information, intimate details are also particularly useful for generating passwords or finding out when uh, the CISO or sysadmins are on vacation and uh, using that as a window of opportunity to breach. Uh, finding out financial information, location information, government records, uh, blueprints of the homes and vacation homes that people live in, uh, court cases that they've been in, legal disclosures, all of this can be used to um, understand not just who a person is or where they live, but literally how they think, um, and sometimes even from birth up into to date. So there are a lot of tools out there that help identify that window of opportunity uh, using uh, open source uh, information on employees. So monitoring traffic patterns, searching for usernames and finding where they're registered. Um, you can use, there's um, an ever-increasing uh, amount of uh, sort of open map or mind mapping tools that let you view this data uh, as a living, breathing organism. So you can literally watch uh, people's interactions and movements take place in real time, monitor their patterns, and use it accordingly. Um, and it's kind of just like Santa Claus, like I see you when you're sleeping, I know when you're awake, um, you know, <laughs> companies have to know, companies have to educate their employees that, and sys administrators that um, people are, are observing them from the outside in. You don't know it, but they're, um, especially for uh, security organizations, you know, your information is public, people are monitoring you, and people can take advantage of uh, the, the, people can exploit um, your behavioral patterns in very nefarious ways. Now, how do you remediate against it? It's tough. Um, you know, education and policy, I think, is, is really key from an organizational perspective, from an enterprise organization. Security awareness training goes probably further than any, anything else that you can do in an organization, just telling employees, educating them that um, there's something called location services that they can turn off, um, educating them uh, that their information can be uh, uh, tracked and pulled via, their geospatial information can be pulled via an API. Um, raising their level of awareness, implementing corporate policies like two-factor authentication, uh, in ensuring strong passwords are made, uh, and, and really just reducing their overall exposure by showing them how to tweak things uh, accordingly. Um, another example is Google dorking. Uh, so Google dorking is uh, crafting, uh, they're specially crafted Google queries using uh, keyword filters or a concatenation of keyword filters to enumerate some uh, piece of information. And from Google dorking, you can retrieve uh, quite a bit of uh, sensitive information, credentials. Uh, I was just messing around the other night with some Google dorks, and I was able to enumerate uh, VPN uh, keys for uh, an Ivy League academic university. Uh, you can pull um, directories that were unintentionally exposed, uh, video, live video streams from people's homes and corporations, um, and lots of other personal info. Um, and if you know, for example, the path of, say, uh, a portal for a piece of hardware or software, like a share drive or a Cisco router, you can 
start to break up the uh, terms of the path and use it. So th some of the first ones, for example, look for, in the URL, they look for FTP. They know the, the URL uh, directory path of a Seagate cloud hard drive has FTP, Seagate, backup, uh, plus, and drive. And if you search for that, you'll enumerate uh, everything that's, uh, that's, that Google has gone through and indexed that was inadvertently exposed. VPN keys, looking for DAT files or other examples. And the real key here is um, really just to know thyself is um, the best piece of advice. Performing, um, performing searches, Google alerts on your name, your company's name, uh, doing sensitive data discovery both inside the organization and in the public internet, and finding the root cause analysis. How did this get here? Was it a misconfiguration? What happened that uh, caused the information to be leaked? Um, also, removing it from indexes can help. Um, metadata is particularly interesting. Metadata is the data behind the data. Um, so when somebody takes a picture, for example, uh, there's all sorts of uh, information about uh, the details of what device took the picture, what was the aperture, what was the lighting, what was the latitude and longitude, where were they located, and this is all embedded in the file itself. So from metadata, um, and there's metadata in Word documents, Google documents, um, Office documents, uh, PDFs, you can extract hardware details, database details, you can find out uh, uh, operating systems, insecure browser plugins, um, again, location data. Looking at you know database metadata, you can sometimes not just pull password hashes or leak credentials, but also know what the secret questions that customers are, uh, or companies are using to uh, um, uh, reset their password. User IDs are handy, and also just thought processes, command line uh, notes, transcripts. Uh, metadata sort of or, uh, was originated, you know, you think about things like uh, microfiche and slides, they used to stamp them with um, the dates or the manufacturer. Uh, you think about libraries using the Dewey Decimal System. These were sort of the origins of metadata, um, and it's really evolved to uh, digital presence. A lot of tools you can use to detect metadata. Um, FOCA is a good example. You can upload uh, directories of files or paths, and it will extract all of the metadata um, behind it. There's a great uh, example of a metadata leak. Uh, when John McAfee was sort of fleeing from the uh, government of Belize or uh, gangs that he didn't pay off, um, you know, they were chasing after him. And while in transit, he decided to meet up with a vice reporter, um, and one of the reporters took a picture of him. Um, and uh, they, uh, while he was running away, they uh, took a picture, and they accidentally forgot to scrub the exit data um, from the picture, and they posted it on Gizmodo. They enumerated his... Uh, entire location. You can see the latitude, the longitude, the altitude. Um, so it's, it's pinpointed to a T, even the camera information that was used. Uh, and they published it on the public internet, which, uh, again, I think was a bit wrong, but um, they, they posted it on Gizmodo. It was there for everybody to see. So how do you defend against uh, metadata leaks? You know, again, going back to awareness. If you just tell your employees that there is data behind the data, they will all of a sudden be conscious that um, there's another layer that they don't necessarily see but exists. Um, switching off uh, um, options that uh, intentionally leak metadata, like your, you know, your location, um, will definitely help to reduce some of that. And also you can scrub or edit the metadata. There's online tools. There are um, uh, 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 OS-based applications that you can run that will scan and, and strip out that, that info. Um, there are a lot of ways we see, uh, a lot of information we see, especially in enterprise, um, uh, uh, pieces of very sensitive information that get leaked out via uh, open source intelligence methods. So these are some common pitfalls that, that um, we see in the community. So uh, finding sensitive DNS records, we'll see companies use, um, you know, public uh, DNS servers to resolve internal domains, and that information will get leaked on the internet, or you can enumerate it. Um, and find, uh, you know, intranet.corp.com, which is probably uh, meant to be internal only. Uh, loads and loads of private keys, those are a goldmine. Most uh, developers, unfortunately, aren't trained to put uh, passphrases on their secret keys, so you can generally hijack those and use them immediately. Um, if you have access to a um, source code repository, you can find all sorts of hard-coded comments that have keys, leaks, thought processes, um, improvements that they haven't made yet, uh, vulnerabilities. Um, Publicly exposed endpoints is an interesting one. So, you know, when a, a retail company, for example, makes an API call to process a credit card, they may have an exchange point, a server. Uh, it may be called, uh, you know, um, company credit card processing.com. So you don't necessarily know it's related to the original company, but they use that endpoint 
uh, to uh, process credit card calls, and that endpoint maybe has to be publicly exposed um, for one reason or another, so that information can be enumerated. Uh, version info, banner info um, are sort of no-brainers. Um, you know, pulling a, vulner uh, a version and then looking for the correlated vulnerabilities uh, manually or with tools. Stack trace errors, another piece of information that's leaked that uh, tells more about um, you know, an unintended exception that took place uh, in your stack. Um, and leaked employee credentials. That's, a, that's another super easy one. So, um, you know, finding, and you could argue that maybe the credential that they use to register on adobe.com isn't the same credential that they use in their, um, in their company, but the really real takeaway there is you educate your employees in, a company, in your organization not to use their corporate password to register on uh, personal websites. I was uh, at a big, big Fortune 100 bank just recently and we found that one of their employees had used their corporate password to register on a Bitcoin website. So how do you feel, how do you think the financial firm felt about employees using uh, Bitcoin and using their corporate address? Um, they weren't too happy. Uh, another example of OS intelligence, maybe observational OS intelligence. So I mentioned it earlier, just being aware, uh, over the shoulder uh, looks, um, you could, even with a high-powered camera or lens, somebody doing espionage could see what you're looking at through the reflection in your glasses, enumerate who you're talking to, or even look at the pupil itself and find out um, what you're looking at or who you're speaking to based on the reflection. Um, so more of a, just kind of food for thought. So what do you do with the data? How do you make it actionable? How do you make it useful? You collect all of this, these random points. Um, the, next thing you, the next thing you do is you have to spend some time analyzing and finding out What's really meaningful? Separating the real true signals from the noise. Um, and then you take action. If you see employee credentials leaked, you make sure that they're not using the same credential, or better yet, just force them to reset their password. Um, if you find um, you know, a database leak, you need to have a, a, a run book or a plan book in place to know how you're going to respond if this information shows up on the internet. And then you make sure that you verify it, make sure that it's truly plugged. Not just plugged, but make sure that you also have the long-term processes in place that will prevent it from going forward. So again, root cause analysis. How did the problem get there? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Most companies don't spend the time looking back in hindsight and, de and deducing how to, looking back in hindsight, deducing the problem, and then implementing a real solution to make sure it doesn't happen again, but that's key to avoiding recurrence. And with third parties, um, it's, it's really the matter of, uh, the way I like to put it is cognitive realignment. Um, when you're working with your third party partners, rather than thinking of it as a hostile engagement where they send you a questionnaire and it's BS and then you ask them for audit reports and they don't want to give them to you and it becomes this very arduous process, working with third parties, the, the methodology has to pivot to joint collaboration. It's all about working with third parties to find these issues, to analyze them to analyze them and then work together, joint collaboration. Work with your partners and say, we need to have a we need to have a talk. I want to keep doing business with you, but I need to make sure that you're at least as secure as I am. Otherwise, I don't want to store my data with you. So let's work together to actually validate what I found, what we found on the public internet. Let's put a, a plan in place to remediate it, and then again, validate it, and then we feel comfortable. And then what, what happens is a beautiful thing. Um, I don't own or operate any of these companies, but I've somehow influenced their security posture. And in turn, I've uplifted my, the security posture of my entire ecosystem, my entire hive, where all of my data is located. Um, now, there are some challenges with open source intelligence. Um, accuracy definitely varies based on uh, the, the methodology and, and techniques that you're using or the volume of data that you're processing. Uh, there's certainly a high signal-to-noise ratio, so um, you know we see that in commoditized intelligence feeds um, or, or any super large data sets, a lot of open source data sets um, don't have too much accurate information, so you need to sort of, it's like panning for gold. You have to look through a lot of sort of sand and fine grain to find the, the meaningful nugget. Uh, the disappearing act, open source intelligence isn't always there. You might find it pop up one day, and then the next day it's been pulled down or banned or censored. Um, making sure the information is accurate and validated. If you're trying to look for this information non-intrusively, um, you may not want to use the credentials to log into a third-party network. Uh, at least on your own home network uh, to start. Um, automation and scale is really tricky. So, um, you know, you can put one or two headcount on an enterprise toward sif uh, uh, sifting for this info, but to scale it up and automate it and have it um, 
constantly populating, and not maybe not just for your company, but all of your vendors, is, is very, very challenging. Um, I don't have a good answer for that one. And also trying to find trends, trying to find uh, predictions. How do I, you know, I don't need to know how my vendor was doing six months ago. I need to know how they're doing right now and if they're trending towards a breach. And sometimes that information can be tricky without having uh, the infrastructure to look at the historical context. And also cadence, finding out, okay, I see a vulnerability, they patched it, but how long did it take for the next vulnerability and patch to, to take place? And having to do that manual, manually can be very exhausting. Um, and I think I'm out of time. That's it on my side. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Security Scorecard is a it's a um, it's a cloud cloud based platform. Uh, it's a service um, that companies use. Uh, they simply enter the URL of the company they want to assess, and within seconds we retrieve a complete non intrusive security assessment looking from the outside in. Um, so it's 100% non intrusive. It's 100% self service, and it helps companies look at their themselves and their third party partners and actually be able to predict when a breach is going to take place reach out to that company proactively, close the loop, and remediate uh, their issues um, so that they can continue to do business. So it's a, a business intelligence tool that um, gives companies additional transparency and insight. Okay. Great, thank you everyone.